Woe to Nineveh! Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. Crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears. Many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses. Nehemiah chapter 3 verses 1 through 3. Before the famed Persian Empire, whose borders spanned from India to Thrace, there was another empire, the Assyrians. The Assyrian Empire, while much smaller than the future Persian Empire to come, made up for its lack of territorial mass with a well-greased, organized fighting machine. What made the Assyrian Empire one of the most terrifying militaries in the ancient world was that they were organized, well-led, well-fed, well-supplied and had the tools to crack into just about any city they so desired. The Assyrian king wasn't just directly involved with state affairs on all levels, he was the state. Every aspect of state affairs, whether it be foreign or domestic, military issues, political issues, or even the religious, was directly linked to him. The king was absolute, but even he had limitations. The Assyrian king, unlike the pharaoh of Egypt, was not divine but despotic. He was a mediator between the gods and his subjects through his spiritual pur purification by both divine and human attendants. Besides the day-to-day -day domestic and foreign affairs dealt with by the king, he was the commander-in-chief of the Assyrian army. Middle Assyrian inscriptions attest, attest to this, as the Assyrian king on his coronation would swear an oath that they would lead their armies in person on annual campaigns of conquest to extend their borders. Even though he was the head of the army, he was a figurehead to a certain degree, for his military duties were diffused and delegated to lesser officials. Before proceeding, it should be understood when I say Middle Assyrian, I'm talking the time period of 1392 to 1056 BC or even to 936 BC. Uh, when I say Neo Assyrian Empire, I'm referring to the times from 911 BC to 605 BC, which would be the fall of the Assyrian Empire. These lesser officials, or this lesser official who would lead armies, was the Turtanu. The Turtanu was second in military command, right under the king. While the king's, well, while the king was in fact the commander in chief of the army, the real responsibility executing his majesty's orders lay in the hands of the uh, Turtanu. Assyrian kings did participate in campaigns, but when unable, the, tar the Turtanu was firmly in charge. Eventually, either Tiglath Pileser III or Sargon II reorganized the office of the Turtanu. In the past, one man held the position. However, this changed. Instead of having one man take charge of the military forces, there, there was to be two. One man was in charge of the left, the other of the, of the right. While not definitive, not, well, this is not definitive in all cases. The post of the Turtanu was assigned to eunuchs. The reason, for, uh, the reason for this was to limit power by ensuring that the man in charge could not pass his office down to his son through inheritance, which in turn limited the power of the office, office and avoid the possibility of a coup. Now, when it comes to army organization and officers, the information on the military organization of the Assyrian army is fragmented and murky. But a word of caution before proceeding. What is about to be presented is based on what is known and what can be considered from what information survives. Understand, the Assyrians really didn't leave a whole lot of information behind concerning how their military is really made up from the top, top down, bottom up. It, they just, we have only the fragments. The Assyrians do provide some history concerning the framework, framework of their military apparatus, so not all is lost. During the 8th century BCE, the Assyrian king could mobilize a force of between 150 to 200,000 men, and, and in extreme cases, 1 million. This seems a bit far-fetched, but was not impossible. In times of war, the Assyrians could field between 20 to 50,000 troops, which would be the equivalent of two or five modern American divisions. Each division consisted of 120 officers. Therefore, two divisions would consist of 240 officers, while five divisions consisted of roughly 416 officers. 
When further broken down, a squad of 10 men was under the control of a non-commissioned officer. Five or 20 squads were formed into a company, a Kursu, under the command of a captain, Rab Kisri or Rab Henry. Please forgive me, I don't really speak Assyrian at all. The amount of men in the Assyrian company probably was made up of five squads totaling 250 men and would take at least four of them to form a battalion. A regiment possibly consisted of three battalions totaling 3,000 men, which seems possible based on the Eurasian system. Or the, um, Ararat is in, the Kingdom of Ararat is another name for it, similar to that of Assyria, and it was under the command of a prefect, or what would be today the equivalent of a modern colonel. As for the size of an Assyrian division, it would seem possible that one division consisted of three, if not more, regiments. By the time of Sargon, they had become a truly iron army. Sargon recognized and integrated the fighting force starting with the conventional units such as infantry, chariots, cavalry, and siege machinery. Next were specialized units to aid support to the conventional, such as scouts, engineers, intelligence officers, sappers. Now, to make sure that this army is well supplied with weapons and armor, Sargon constructed a single weapons room called Fort Sargon, which contained, which contained 200 tons of weapons and body armor from which his men could draw now when it comes to the Syrian military apparatus it consisted of cavalry, chariots, infantry, and archers. However, there's just a word of caution here. When it comes to cavalry, uh, the Assyrian Empire, especially during the Middle Assyrian Empire and somewhat into the Neo-Assyrian Empire, they didn't really have cavalry just yet. They just mainly used chariots. Cavalry was to come a little, just a little bit later during the Neo-Assyrian Empire. But when it came to early mobility, the Assyrians relied on chariots, like most Near Eastern nations. However, during the reign of Ashurbanipal II in the 9th century BCE, reliefs Tiglath Pileser III took note of what is already in use, pertaining to his own cavalry force, and he improved upon it by investing into developing better cavalry units, whereas their enemies later on, the Scythians and Cimmerians, continued to evolve into a much better fighting force that adapted to the natural conditions and to the conduct of their enemies. In other words, to improvise, adapt, overcome. After conquering a portion of Western media, Tiglath Pileser incorporated Median cavalry into his own army and from then on effectively changed the nature of the Assyrian cavalry from charioteer teams to mounted warriors armed with bow and spear. The days of the chariot as master of the battlefield were nearing an end but were not over yet. Over time the Assyrian army had three types of cavalry. The first type was light cavalry which consisted of Medes and other nomads who were quick and who primarily used the bow and javelin. Next were Assyrian heavy archers. This unit consisted of men and heavy scale body armor. Finally, the heavy cavalrymen were fully armored and designed for fighting heavy infantry. However, the Assyrian use of heavy cavalry for shock is uncertain. Cavalry under Tiglath Pileser III on through Sargon II seem to be primarily skirmishers. There is, however, cavalry depicted during the time of Sargon II on reliefs which is shown to be carrying spears and charging in the battle, which may suggest the evolution of the Assyrian shock cavalry was well underway. Tiglath Pileser III and his successors loved the new cavalry so much that they replaced most of the chariot units with elite cavalry units over time. To put this into perspective, the kings, his nobles, and warrior elite were the only ones permitted to use the chariot. Assyrian infantry could be divided into three types, spearmen, archers, and slingers. Spearmen were well armored and are the foundation of the Assyrian army. Their primary function was to provide defense and offense. When on the defense, it was the spearman's job to support skirmishing and cavalry, to maneuver around them, and to find targets that could be softened up, which would take pressure off the lines and allow the infantry to go on the offense. These spearmen were armed with a shield, spear, and a dagger or short sword. Archers were also well armored and used a recurve bow. In some reliefs, Assyrian archers are accompanied by a shield bearer who provided protection as the archer discharged his arrow. Archers in battle were usually placed in front of the heavy infantry ranks to shower arrows down upon the enemy before retreating behind the spearmen once the enemy was too close for comfort. 
The Syrian archers in the reliefs also appear to be wearing short swords as well. Another skirmishing unit utilized to harass the enemy was slingers. Slingers, as the name applies, slung well-rounded rocks at the enemy. While the distance was not as great as an archer, the power generated upon release caused tremendous damage as it was meant to crush, unlike the arrow which was used to pierce. Slingers, like archers, would be out in front of the spearmen harassing the enemy infantry or engaging the enemy skirmishing detachments. However, Assyrian horse archers and those carrying javelins could and did act as skirmishing detachments who could, with the right covering fire from the archers, could quickly ride up on the enemy lines, whether infantry or skirmishers, and discharge their projectiles before riding off. This will end part one. Uh, in part two, we'll examine the Siege of Lachish. We're going to use that, uh, the Siege of uh, Lachish, to get a better uh, idea of how the Assyrian military uh, in the field worked. Now, it's not going to be exact, but the reliefs do show and tell quite a bit of how they conducted their sieges and it may give us an idea how they conducted field battles. So I hope you have a great day. If you like this video, please hit the like button. Leave your comments below. No fighting. And remember, if you really like the content that you hear, please subscribe to the channel. Share the videos and tell your friends.